Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So glad you could join Lynn Evola and myself tonight as we talk about the Peace Angels projects. I believe that this is an amazing uh, project and I'm so excited to have Lynn because I wanted to have her on about four to five years ago when I first started the Pembroke Taparelli Art and Film Festival, we were dealing with gun violence. And so Lynn's project, because of the work that she does, I wanted her to be a part of that conversation. But unfortunately she couldn't join us. So we moved on, but here she is today, six, five years later. And I'm so excited to be having this conversation with Lynn. So Lynn, what I'd like to do is just have you tell us a little bit about yourself and about how the Peace Angels project came about, and then uh, we can take, you know, move on from there. Okay. Well, my name is Lenny Vola. I'm the founder of the Peace Angels project. The Peace Angels project was inspired because I found out that a thousand children had been killed in LA County the year before, and my son was eight. And it just wasn't okay with me. So the Peace Angels Project is a story of Los Angeles in a way, and it brings up the different cultures, not all the different cultures, but 12 of the cultures. And it melts down weapons that come from source countries where the grudges are brought here. Mm -hmm. So the Peace Angels Project took two years to research and to write and to come up with a name and to figure out that I only wanted to use authentic weapons weapons that came from real relationships. So, you know, anyone can, I used to say anyone can melt down a, a, a gun. It's not rocket science, you melt down metal. It's easy, it happens every day. But it's more difficult to build relationships with different kinds of people that may or may not seem like they're on the other side of the table. Right. So it took me some a while, and I researched that the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was probably the most powerful law enforcement agency in the United States. And it took me about five years before I met with Sheriff Block and enrolled him in the concept that we were really the same, because he had just started the rebar program. People don't realize that guns and weapons are in every construction, basically all construction. Mm -hmm. It's just not known and it's not seen. So they'll make rebar and it'll go into a bridge or a road or a house, but you don't know it, no one knows it. So what I was saying to him is that with the Peace Angels, we could not only create something of great beauty and inspiration, but use the media of the message mm -hmm. to enroll people to give up more weapons to save their own lives to make the peace angels. So it was kind of circular. You know, they would make a decision for themselves, but in fact, they were making a decision for their family. Right. I had met a young Latino man uh, years ago when I was spending a lot of time in East LA doing research at the very beginning with Homeboy and Father Greg Boyle. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to a restaurant and I'm always drawing so I'm standing there drawing and this young man came up to me, he was the waiter. And he had the tattoos and everything. And he said, um, you're, you know, Lenny Vola. And I said, yes. And he said, I just want you to know that, you know, you saved my life. And I said, well, you know, like humbly speaking, what, you know, what, what? And he said, um, his wife was in school or working he was in medical school even though he was waiting they had their kids in school he wasn't in a gang anymore and that kind of turning point is always at the core of the peace angels project the way it is written wow that is awesome you mentioned that you started the peace angels project in 1992 is that yeah. when your son was eight at that point was that the point yeah, he's 37 now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's a lot of years. The Peace Angel Monument, the big one, took from that moment until 2013 when the design was finished. And even now, as we start to work on the big one, when we really start to do production, there's probably an artist per foot that will work on it. Almost 100 artists will be employed to work oh, wow. on it. 
Yeah. And when that happens, you'll have things that adjust, you know, and then architects get involved and it changes the, you know, everything. It, it, it's a little bit of movement, right? It stays with the basic design. But before all that, it took from 1992 to 2013 just to finish the drawings of that monument. So the art itself takes a lot. It takes a lot. So working with the different communities, you know, the design can take on a beginning, you know, mm -hmm. look, and then it goes through some adjustments. Mm -hmm. How do you sustain yourself? <laughs> You're, you, a lot of times with art, and especially with the, in, within the social justice movement, it can be heartbreaking, the, the things that you see and the things that you encounter. Yeah. How do yeah? How do you maintain your inspiration and your sanity within this? You know that framework, with within all the things that you see around you with humanity. You no, know, that is the best question anybody's asked me in a long <laughs> time. I have to tell you, nobody asked me that question. And I used to tell friends at the UN, I can jump in and I can be here for a week or ten days, and then I have to get out because you can't, I can't comprehend the pain human beings cause each other. Right. So I have two things that save my life. One is, you know, people I love, you know, mm -hmm. being in interaction with them. And then I make art and I make a lot of art. I don't know if you can see behind me the peace signs, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the decommissioned nuclear stainless steel. They're the only peace signs on, you know, that I know of that, that have that. And so making the art and people I love are basically the most important parts to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard though. I, I, I'm thankful that you asked that because there were times, you know, years ago that I almost quit several times just mm -hmm. because of that reason. Right. And, and now have you talked about earlier about being a material girl? Yeah. And about, and you know, with art, a lot of times th these are the compromises, right? Or these are the sacrifices that we sacrifice um, financial success. At least that's the 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 con the the the, um, the idea. Or I, I don't know if that's idea is the right word, but that's the what we're taught, right? That if, if we're going to be artists, we're going to be struggling artists. We're not going to make any money. Yeah, see, I, don't, um, I don't believe in that at all, <laughs> not even slightly. That's mm -hmm. why I say when I was a little kid uh, in the old neighborhood in Chicago, south side of Chicago, I would be selling art on the street. Mm -hmm. I, I love selling art because I love to have people own it. And mm -hmm. I love the money that it gives me to go ahead and do other stuff, right? I've right. always loved that exchange. So having exhibitions, having making art, you know, fashion, I I was not giving up that side of it just to work on the music. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so you never had the title right? You never had the title struggling starving artist. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, actually don't like that you know why mm -hmm. because it sets up a mindset yes and it's an insult and you have these artists that are re remarkable i mean just remarkable and i feel that artists have to capture lightning mm -hmm. and you have to be pretty pretty strong to do that and you have to be able to take in uh information that most people don't ever want to know whether it's good or bad it's just very powerful Thing that happens right. so no i i think it's very insulting and i think that it may take seven gener seven lifetimes to be a really great artist whether mm -hmm. it's music or film or fashion whatever it is it, it could take a long time you've got to be born with the fire in you right you have to be born with that level of talent i don't think you get a better level of talent i just think you get better at skills but you better be born with it Mm -hmm. yeah, that's how I feel about it. So do you feel, okay, you, and just going with the born with the talent, born with that fire in you, but do you think that artists can be uh, 
a lot of people go to college, right? And study art and learn to be artists. Do you think there's a distinction between someone who has that natural fire in the belly type of um, talent and then those that are taught, so to speak? Because I know some people make that distinction, especially within acting and what goes on there with people who are you know, on TikTok these days versus those who have gone to universities and studied for years. And so is there, in, in the art world, is there such a, a distinction as well? Well, I can only answer for me, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, everybody's got a different answer for that question. Right. When my son wanted to be a video game designer, he was born with the talent, just like I was born, right? Mm -hmm. And I told him he couldn't even look sideways till he graduated from college. <laughs> so many young people and I don't know I might have been the same if I hadn't mm -hmm. I went to Santa Clara University I went to San Francisco Art Institute I became a stockbroker you know I, I did an MBA that I got a perfect score and I got an MFA in art and I had exhibitions all over the world I could not have approached the Peace Angels project without all of that help and information Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have someone with such raw talent that they just burst into flame and that's it. And I, I don't make any judgment on it. Right. But a lot of times, especially, um, I don't know if I should say especially artists because I am one, maybe I'm paying more attention, but they'll take shortcuts and they don't have a skill base. Mm -hmm. And then when they want to use that skill base, they don't have it to rely on. Mm -hmm. Like what I saw... Um, I was at Santa Clara University. My uncle was the dean of the school. There was a lot of pressure. <laughs> and I had an art teacher there and I insisted that he teach me anatomy one-on-one -on -one because I wanted to know it. I wanted all the skills in my pocket. I'm very selfish that way. I wanted to have it with me. And then if I need it, fine, if I don't need it, but it's mine. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to San Francisco Art Institute, the artists that taught there were more artists than teachers. Mm -hmm. they, were the, they were really amazing. And that's why I got into conceptual art and performance art and painting. I was only a painter, never took a sculpture class. Mm. And I learned from the best. I really did. But I was able to fly because I already had those skills in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Then I could use them however I wanted to, but, they, but I owned them. And that, I think, is the best way to look at it. If you're, if you're a young artist, be a little bit selfish and get the skills that you can be in charge of. And then you can decide if you want to use them or not. Right. You know, But don't be at the effect of somebody who tells you that your first abstract paintings throwing paint on it are glorious. Because <laughs> 10 years from now, mm -mm. I, I'm not an art teacher, but I'll tell you a quick story. I, um, during my MFA program, I had a wonderful artist that I worked with. It was brilliant. And like a lot of the artists, they would give their assistants, you know, most of the work to do. Because <laughs> they were making art. And um, yeah, it was my job as a, a master of fine art. They only accepted like 800 people a year from the whole mm -hmm. world at most. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. So, um, I worked with all the students in the class trying, my goal was that they make a breakthrough, whatever it was for them that they make, you know, that was my time with them, then they would, they would go past what they knew and, and have a breakthrough for themselves. There was one man in the class and he was, you could tell, he, his family was suffering because he was in there. He made the same drawing over and over again with these horrible little squiggly things in every armpit and every dark section in the body, right? And I helped everybody, but every time I got near him, he would get really grouchy. And I knew that meant that he just wasn't ready. So I ignored him. And at the end of the class, um, Carlos Villa was the artist name, told me to give everybody some homework, which I did. And the room, everybody was humming. Everybody was doing great, really. Except for this one guy, he started yelling. And I started smiling. And I looked at him and I said, are you ready? And he said, yeah. I said, all right. I said, I want you to break every pencil you own. 
<laughs> so he had to stand there and break all the pencils. I said, throw every single piece of that horrible paper away. Throw it away. <laughs> and he did. And then from the class, I asked everybody, I said, now give him new tools, give him pencils, give him smudge, you know, give him papers, you know, give him stuff. He took off like a rocket. He, he ended up being the best artist in the whole class because he reached his place where he couldn't go further with what he knew. Mm. And he built it. And it was brilliant to see. And I love to see. One of the things I look most forward to with this project is hiring a lot of artists giving them jobs mm -hmm. and use their skill base and let them fly. You know, that's, we, the, our culture is really strange right now. Um, we diminish what the artists have to say. We ask for a commercialism that's just too low a bar to tell you the truth. Yes. All kinds of prices on it that don't make any sense to anybody. And there's too much relying on dealers and galleries and not enough on the studio and the actual power of the artist. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. I really am. Uh, you know, I, I love what you're saying, especially the fact that you're, you'll be able to have so many people work on this one piece. Yeah. You know, so many people put their voice forth. I think that is so amazing. I would have, you know, I would, when you think of art, you think of it being a solo experience, yeah. the artists with their tools and they draw, but what you're doing is getting a lots of people in. So that's amazing. I really, I really like that. Yeah, and, and will that be all the, the angels that will be um, built in this way? We're only working on an 11 footer. I mean, ba basically, oh, okay. this is a silly, but it's a kind of a yardstick. Basically, at the foundry, there's about an artist per foot. Mm -hmm. So if you have an 11 footer, it's not, you know, it's 11 artists, maybe right. 20, right? Different skills. Mm -hmm. But once you get to the big, big, big monuments, yeah, then you're having a team that's working two, three years on one monument. Wow. And because of the actual project which i don't know how much I've, I've sent you in information the other part that i love about this is that there's many ways to come about the art that all is important in order to create it like these weapons guys right to give us the weapons and the shippers and the people who have to store this the people who break it and destroy it the international contacts the national mm -hmm. contacts the politicians involved and the accountants and the lawyers. I mean, right. we've worked now all these years and the team is very stellar, very tight group of people. Mm -hmm. You have production managers that do nothing but work on museums that are working with us. Mm -hmm. And so I started off in Los Angeles, but because at the time, 1998, there was no founder here. The art foundry um, that I found was because Jeff Koons did a, for, a Louis XIV bust mm -hmm. and it was at LA Louvre and it actually had facial features and details. And stainless steel was created for linear use for architecture, construction. It's the hardest metal, but it was made for straight line use. So to have the facial features and the details with a straight line metal is such an oxymoron that it will blow up furnaces. So I had to go to New York because Polish Artworks, Polish Talix, I think at the time, was in New York. That's mm -hmm. why I went there. Now, the young guys that have purchased that foundry are from Australia, and they have Australia, New York, Shanghai, Singapore. So there's foundries now all over the world that I can mm. work on. Oh. But the guy here, Landon Ryan is his name, really nice guy. Um, his foundry is very small. He can handle the 11 footers, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But the big 64 footer may have to be done in New York or we'll figure out some kind of combination of things. But right. the skill, what I'm trying to say is that over this time, even the art world couldn't have done it at the beginning right. of this project. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask, you, you mentioned the foundries being all over the world. Now, tell me a little bit about the international aspect of the Peace Angels project. Um, how do we take this into globally? Well, this is the thing I always say, right? Los Angeles is the United States of the United States. 
people have come here from all over the world. It's true. But people have also come here from all over the United States. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you bring people is you bring their grudges with them. So you bring their talents, but you also bring their grudges with them. Mm -hmm. Those grudges came from somewhere. They came from what I call source countries. To, so to do echo sites in those source countries overseas mm -hmm. takes going there. So say for the Sarajevo Peace Angel, I spent a good deal of time in the Balkans after the war. Again, it, it refers back to what you, you said earlier. It was one of the times I, I could have easily quit, mm -hmm. uh, very easily quit. And um, the Museum of Contemporary Art there wants the Sarajevo Peace Angel. It has the three angels, Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbia that, that hold each other's hands. It's based on Rodin's Burgers of Calais. So what I'd like is for that peace angel to go to the Getty here in LA. We'll see how it, it all goes, but that's right. my vision. That's my vision. And at the same time, it would have to go to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. Because that, those grudges, they came here. To do the Africa Peace Angel um, was one of my greatest honors of my life, spending the day with Archbishop Tutu when he unveiled my Spirit of Africa at the Premier Museum in Johannesburg. And my, you know, we're in conversations now with different people, but my, my vision would be to have it in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. now, Af no, go ahead. Peace Angel though, would have to bring in weapons from the continent of Africa, as well as, you know, uh, LA. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about the weapons portion of the, the monuments and the statutes, will each community that gets an angel, will that the weapons come out of those communities as well? Or, yes. okay. Yeah. Yes, very much so. The, it's important to me, two things besides the actual art, right? We already covered mm -hmm. that part. I spent right. years on this one, right? But the two other parts that are not negotiable is that you have to have the enemy weapons of the place and you have to have the site that means something. Mm -hmm. So like in Kashmir, the India Peace Angel in Kashmir would include Muslim and Hindu weapons. But it would be the site that would be have to be agreed upon by two warring groups that disagree on almost everything. Mm -hmm. It makes the sites much more difficult, but much more provocative, more interesting to me, because I don't want it, you know, on Joe Blow's lawn. You know, I want right. it to do something. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, with that said, which I did not know, um, when you think about LA and you think about where you're planning to put the Peace Angel in LA, let's say, are we thinking um, an area that has the Crips and the Bloods and the the disciples and the varying gangs, um, where they all kind of culminate, or is that a part of it, or is it just people who have been, you know, killed by guns and things of that nature? Well, each of the peace angels has a very strong narrative. Mm -hmm. Under each peace angel will be a 10 by 10 foot labyrinth that has the carving of the story of that peace angel. Okay. The story is really important, right? So the Crips and the Bloods gave weapons to the Peace Angels Project in 1997. They were part of our, our unveiling of the Renaissance Peace Angel. And Go, moving forward now, we have a church in South Central that we've been in conversation for a while. Mm -hmm. and they would like to um, work with us. We want to work with them. And bringing forward 600 churches to ask for the community to, to give up weapons for their peace angel. Right. So yeah, each one of these will be a story and weapons indicative of that culture and the, the things that are most important to that culture independent and connected. So say the African-American community and say we, we you know, request these weapons and they're collected and we forge the monument and it ends up at the California African-American Museum. I would have to work out something with the museum that people can go see it. We'd have okay. to do something out, right? Yes. But then we get to the big monument, the 64 foot monument, the story of the African-American community 
will be integrated on the labyrinth that's 100 by 100 feet now, not 10 by 10, but 100 by 100 that integrates with all the stories of all the neighborhoods. So okay. it's the microcosm and the macrocosm. Okay. And now, when I think of, you said there are 12 sites. Can you talk a little bit about maybe another community outside of the African American community where Peace Angel will be commit, dedicated to that um, community and where those weapons will be coming from? And what would be that story? If well, you'd like to share. The Jerusalem Peace Angel with the Museum of Tolerance would be my choice. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's a question. And this is a very provocative question. Mm -hmm. Because for that peace angel, would we melt down Israeli and Palestinian weapons? Would we melt down Nazi weapons? Mm. Where do we go with the story? You know, for the Bosnian, Croatian, uh, Sarajevo peace angel, mm -hmm. are you looking at Serbian weapons as well as Croatia and Bosnia? And also mm -hmm. the fact that guns now are a big part of the Japanese culture, which it never was. Do you oh. ask the youth weapons in Tokyo? Mm -hmm. These are all um, ongoing narratives on what is the significance of the weapon and why would they use it and which, which ones do we melt down? The United States is going to be involved in all of them because I'm from here. Right. And the gift is also, you know, I always say your greatest talent is also your worst element, really. <laughs> and the United States has the most nuclear stainless steel. Mm -hmm. So it will end up being in all the monuments. Mm. The Korean uh, Peace Angel will have weapons from North and South Korea, mm -hmm. as well as the Korean community here. The goal is to have one at the DMZ. The Vietnam uh, Peace Angel, again, would have some from the culture, but North and right. South Vietnam. In China, um, getting Chinese weapons is going to be interesting. But one of the things that I did when I was at the UN was to ask every single country, myself, if they mm -hmm. would give a certain amount of weapons for a Peace Angel, and they said yes. That is only the first conversation. I'm not naive, but right. we have you know, the steps going toward it. So every yes. single one of these stories has um, a reason. Yes, I love this. And um, I wanna give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions they may have. Um, we are gonna be going until 8 p.m. Um, PST, because uh, <laughs> I know it's kind of late for some folks who are on here from um, the East Coast. So, but thank you so much for joining us. But if you have any questions, um, if you'd like, you can raise your hand and I can, you can turn on your camera and your microphone and ask the question. Um, or if you, you can put it in the chat and uh, we can, uh, I can read the question there. So I'd love for anyone that has a question for Lynn to jump in um, at this point. And I'd also like to say, Lynn, can you tell us where people can contribute to the Peace Angels project if they're interested in making any kind of contributions to you um, and yeah, to the, to the project? At, they can email me at info at peaceangels.com. If they go to the website, um, peaceangels.com, right? Uh, you can send it to info at peaceangels.com. And I, I put it in the, I'm sorry, I put it in the chat for everyone. If anyone would like to make a contribution to the work that Lynn is doing, please um, do so at info at peaceangels.com. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so we'll continue until someone jumps in with a question. Um, I was thinking that I would, Felix. I would, like, I would like to say mm -hmm. that one of the things that people like the most is receiving one of the drawings of the peace angels or one of the peace signs that I have for sale. And all along the path of the Peace Angels project, it's been collectors who did that, that actually funded the Peace Angels project. Mm -hmm. And so we have beautiful drawings of all the Peace Angels. You can purchase a sculpture, but it's a lot more money. And then the Peace <laughs> also have the decommissioned nuclear stainless. Right. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Now, let me ask what you mentioned that you've been working on the Peace Angels project for a number of years, but in between, um, you've also been doing your art and selling your work and, and doing shows and exhibitions and things of that nature. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you do outside of the Peace Angels project? There is none. At this point, there is none. This is it. This is what you're working on. Yeah, the, the story is so deep mm -hmm. that there, I really don't have any interest. Like, we melt down weapons, so that could be a helicopter. Mm -hmm. mm. We, I make weapons blocks. They could be as big as your hand or as big as a building. So the story and the weapons and the images are so powerful to me. I'm just 100% I'm just in it. We did, I did some beautiful flowers, like um, years ago, I did some research, obviously on Israel and Golda Meir had taken people from the Holocaust and put them in these places that looked like the Holocaust, right? Because mm -hmm. they didn't have any homes built, they didn't have anything. And she found out six years later, six years into these people living in these places that the children there had never seen a flower. Mm -hmm. And it started this whole thing with me to draw flowers and include the weapons metal. So I have these, this series called Leonardo's Flowers that have um, the weapons metal in them, kind of almost dedicated to these kids. Mm -hmm. So I don't, um, I have so many things that I have to say and so many works of art. Like if we have a minute, the sputtered pieces. Mm -hmm. I had made that promise to myself early on that I would destroy the weapons to the molecule. So I found a process in 2013, it took a while, to create these beautiful mirror-like surfaces that could have photography in it, right? It could have images of people or war, conflict, peace, build, create the five movements of man. Um, but you'd also see the viewer. So you'd have a huge room full of these super mirrors that are made of the most powerful weapon on earth. So who is a a person that you admire? Who's someone you admire? Me, personally? Malcolm yeah. X. <laughs> okay. So say we had a gorgeous photograph of Malcolm X mm -hmm. in, as a portrait of a humanitarian, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're standing there and you're looking in the super mirror and you see yourself and you see him at the same time. Oh, and wow. The, and the vehicle is the most dangerous weapon. So it's I love it because it, I feel like art can hold contradictions Absolutely. and very, very powerful trajectories all at once. That's what makes it so powerful. So mm -hmm. if your love and admiration for Malcolm X is, is the person standing in front of you and yet you realize the reason you can see that reflection is this horrible weapon that could kill all of us, right? So mm -hmm. does the sputter pieces. So those that's are the interesting. Art projects that I'm working on that even though they're not the peace angels, they are. It's still the same story. Yeah. That's really interesting because, you know, when you think about when you talked about that image, for me it was this is someone that was at a turning point in his life in terms of how he saw the world and what he thought we could do as humanity. And then he was taken by gun violence. Right. You know, that he was at yeah. that place where he was changing and, you know, moving in a different direction in life. And then the gun violence came in. And a lot, you know, if you think about it, except for a few of our heroes, most of them were taken by gun violence. I know. Yeah. I know. So that, you know, a lot of people, you know, were taken through gun violence or just violence in general, um, you know, so that's def this is, that's a really interesting, um, the sputter pieces are very interesting in that respect. Around the monument, the big monument downtown, mm -hmm. outside of the labyrinth that tells the story of Los Angeles will be the weapons blocks that have the names of everyone we've lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay, so we have a question from Alan Edmondson. He says, <laughs> <laughs> I take it you know Alan. Okay, yes. he says, thank you for your amazing vision, Lynn. Oh. Now that you're located in LA, how do you see the tone there in terms of openness to the bigger vision 
especially during this time of transition from the pandemic to recovery? Love that That's question. A really good question. So Los Angeles is starting to open up here now, right? And mm -hmm. the one thing that I kept working so hard on this last year was to get the peace angels ready so that as people came out of this, they could raise up with a level of hope with the peace angels in front of them. So what I think is, is important is to um, connect now with everybody who wants to work on the Peace Angels Project. Like since I got here, the very first site, and I hope I'm answering Ellen's question, but we can go back to it if I'm not, mm -hmm. um, is being requested. We have two groups that have come in to volunteer to start helping us actualize the Peace Angels both in fundraising and parties, like maybe Zoom, who knows, with COVID, right? But different ways of communicating the Peace Angel message, including yourself, mm -hmm. um, to start to get this out now and get this completed. So I think it's, it's a perfect timing in the openness of the community and what's actually happened to us in the pandemic. And to Alan Edmondson, uh, I always think the Peace Angels Project is a climate change project because it deals mm -hmm. with recycling mm. on a very big level. And we have, in order to take care of our world and each other, um, we have to recycle the violence. Right. Interesting. Um, okay, let me see. Does anyone else have another question? Okay, Lynn, so we have uh, three minutes. Would you like to tell us anything or is there anything that you'd like to, us to know about where you're going with this project and how we can support the work that you're doing? Thank you. Um, yes, right now, Los Angeles, that's what we're talking about, is beginning the very first Peace Angel. Creation, production, everything. We're gonna start with the LA Sheriff's Department, taking the photographs and being in the media, showing the weapons, the guns mostly, that are being given to the Peace Angels Project. And we're going to start a request for weapons in all the communities throughout LA. Because this last year caused so much fear mm -hmm. that the gun sales went through the roof. So we're hoping that now we can ask people for weapons. We're mm -hmm. going to ask people for contributions to, in order to produce the art, it costs money. We have jobs to pay. We pay people to work. It's not mm -hmm. volunteer to work. So those two ways really help. Help mm -hmm. by volunteering, help by giving money, give your weapons. If you have them, give them. Right. Now, you know, I, I forgot to ask this question, but just to, just wondering, have you had any conversations with the NRA or has there been any pushback from the NRA or the no, no, no. actually I don't know if we have enough time but I'd like to answer that question no the please please do project is about saving lives right and period and we stand in the middle like I said between the social justice and the weapons dealers the conversations I had with the NRA at the world at the United Nations were very positive believe it or not very okay. positive because what they were talking about was responsibility and my question to them was, there's 23% of young people in this country that have already said they're gonna carry weapons. Mm -hmm. What are you, are you mentoring these young people? Is there training? Can you, you know, there has to be responsibility. Right. Especially with young men, with older men, they ha there has to be some responsibility here. And to have total chaos by saying there shouldn't be any weapons when there are, uh, doesn't make sense. Right. So, you know, I, I think it goes back to having respect for each other. We have to learn to have a little bit of respect for each other and to know that maybe that other person learned something that we don't know. But that goes on both sides. It's not just yes. one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I just wanted to say, I, I didn't have a question so much as I have a comment. One thing that really strikes me about this project, hearing it again, um this evening is how it um uh, touches our commonalities that i think is so important could be so important to us right now mm -hmm. um uh, you know i i'm in washington dc and um uh witnessed what happened on january 6th and mm -hmm. you know and then 
Um, I, uh, at the time of the riots in June, I was a block above Hollywood Boulevard, which is where I lived at that time. And um, our, there are so many divisions between all of us, especially in America and across the world. Um, but what I enjoyed about hearing this, um, about what Lynn was saying today is just like all, race and class and um, so many divisions we can all raise between us fell away in the commonality of suffering that we inflict upon each other mm -hmm. um, and, and how insane and absurd it is. And Lynn, um, before I forget, I know a member, I know a, um, uh, a former president of the board of NRA, um, and I think he's still on the board. And um, he's a, um, I am very friendly with him. He's actually a very nice guy. Don't let me forget to um, work that contact for you, okay. um, um, because uh, the NRA needs some good press, shall we say? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and and um, if they want to show some respect, and, and they are like, you know, this man actually is a gentleman. He's in fact, um, he is the son of a famous civil rights um, mm -hmm. um, man. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now. He's African American mm -hmm. and his father was a very famous figure in the civil rights. Um, but in, he's an NRA board member and I'd mm -hmm. like to talk to him about this project. So, okay, that's all. And thank you both. Um, that was very nice. Thank you, thank so you Felix. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for staying on. And, you know, so you could get the opportunity to share that because I think that's very important to, uh, to hear um, in terms of the NRA, because, you know, of course, when it comes to gun violence, they get a bad rap because, you know, we're blaming their, their stance on gun and the second amendment when that's not necessarily the case, right? It's about the communities, about people, it's about humanity, it's about people doing better with each other, not necessarily getting rid of guns right? Guns is not the problem in and of itself. So I think it's important that you brought that up in the fact that they have been responsive to Lynn's project in a positive way. And if there's any way to get them some good press, I don't see why that should be a problem. So yeah. that's pretty good. Yes. Thank you so much good. for sharing that. Yeah, good. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. And thank you both. Lynn, it was such a pleasure talking to you tonight and thank you all for joining us um once again i'd just like to say we're ptaf pember taparelli arts and film festival um, we're a nonprofit organization and this is our our mission is to bring artists like lynn to an audience share their voice share their work so that we can all be a part of social change. I think social change is not up to the government. It's not up to the president. It's not up to the legislator. It's up to each and every one of us. We all have a role to play in social change. Um, in us, you know, being better human beings and being better to the planet, being better neighbors and mothers and daughters and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Lynn, do you have any last words? Just people be kind to each other, that's all. Thank you yes. so much. You're welcome. So you can follow us on Instagram at, at P PTA Film Festival and Lynn is on Instagram as well at Peace Angels Project. Peace Angels Project with an S. And we are PTFF. As I said, you can follow us on Instagram. Please visit our website to learn more about what we're doing and the work that we're doing as well.